Aloha and welcome to Hawaii Together on the Think Tech Hawaii Broadcast Network. I'm Kili'i Akina, your host and president of the Grassroot Institute. If you have been aware of anything at all, you know that we've been in a state of emergency for the last two years. As of March 4th, it will be two years since the president, excuse me, since the governor first pronounced the state of emergency to deal with the COVID situation. And that's quite a long time. Originally, it was supposed to be a 60 day emergency period. We're taking a look at this in depth today. Our topic is ending Hawaii's state of emergency. As you know, Hawaii legislators have introduced several bills that would limit the governor's potentially endless emergency powers. According to Malia Hill, the Grassroot Institute of Hawaii Policy Director, the goal is to bring a much needed end to the state's economic and social lockdowns and restore the government's constitutional checks and balances. We're gonna talk with Malia today. You've seen her on the program before, and I wanna welcome Malia. Aloha all the way from the East Coast near Washington, DC. Malia Hill, welcome to the program, Malia. Hi, Kali'i, so nice to be back. Well, you've been an important part of the Grassroot Institute for quite a while. When you lived in Hawaii, you, you worked on legislative staff and became part of the Institute. Then when you moved away, you stayed on board virtually, at least, as our representative up on the East Coast in D.C. Well, what, what keeps you with the Grassroot Institute? Well, you know, my body may be here in Washington, D.C. and very chilly, but my heart is still in Hawaii. Um, I have family in Hawaii, you know, like so many people um, I had to leave. But, you know, those of us who leave, we always sort of think, you know, one day I want to come back. And, you know, one day I want to come back and I want to, while I'm away, contribute to making Hawaii better, happier, more prosperous. Well, thanks to the technology of distance communication, you're here with us constantly on a daily basis in the islands, and we appreciate your policy work. You have been published here in local media, and you continue to do significant work that helps improve the quality of life of many people in the state. Now, let's get to the topic today. Uh, Governor Ige just extended the emergency again through his latest proclamation, which is going to terminate on March 25th. At this point, it seems safe to say that we're in somewhat of an indefinite state of emergency. But, you know, there are a lot of questions about the law that the, allows the governor to make the emergency proclamations. What was it intended for? And, and explain to us a little bit about that law. Yeah, you know, because of the way that the COVID emergency has gone, you know, we are looking at the statute in an entirely different way. But, you know, originally, you know, we're all familiar with the emergency management statute. The intention is, as it's right there in the name, it's to give the governor uh, powers to act quickly um, and to respond to an emergency. And you think of it as something that you need to respond to, obviously, you know, times of war or, you know, military kind of action, but also hurricanes, natural disasters. And we usually see it employed with, you know, things like hurricanes and flooding, that sort of thing. But what in the last two years over the course of the COVID emergency, we've seen that this law was not really made with the intention of dealing with a problem that is going to go on for indefinitely. Um, the emergency statute as it is has an automatic termination of 60 days. And it has, as we've noticed, we're, we're way past 60 days. And what has happened is that the governor just keeps extending the emergency and taking advantage of the powers that he has by virtue of the statute to um, basically somewhat usurp the legislative function. Uh, and we've actually gotten to the point where it's you know, the governor has been extending this emergency indefinitely, contrary to the clear intent of the statute. And we've even gotten to the situation where some of the changes that we've been living under, under this COVID emergency, things like changes in licensing restrictions for doctors and nurses, those kinds of things, people almost want that part to continue, but it's all tied up in these emergency proclamations. And Fundamentally, this is just not the good democratic way to run a state government. Well, you know, it's kind of ironic that although it's not ideal to be in a state emergency, that has loosened up the government with regard to some regulations, as you mentioned, such as telemedicine and so forth. So here we are needing to bring medical personnel into Hawaii to deal with the emergency, but we have to amend the law to allow them to be licensed 
sort of what we've been advocating for all the time, reciprocal licensing. And, and so, so that is really an irony. I'm glad you pointed that out. Now, let, let me ask you this. Why, therefore, is it a problem if the governor keeps extending the, the emergency? And now that the most ex restrictive orders have been lifted, uh, maybe we need the extended proclamations to deal with these, <laughs> for example, to like, like travel, or am I being too glib about that? You know, it's, it's, it's a, actually an interesting question because, you know, it was no difficulty talking about this, you know, at the beginning of the, you know, pandemic when people were starting to get frustrated at the lockdown, but now that the worst of the lockdown has been lifted, it isn't impacting people's lives in the same way. So the question comes, you know, what is really the problem here? And to some extent, I'm afraid I'm going to have to be philosophical and say that, you know, the extended emergency upsets the balance of power. It prevents the people from having a voice in the conduct of the emergency. And those democratic principles still matter. The emergency, especially as it is now, the law basically allows the governor to exercise legislative powers like suspending laws and creating new regulations for as long as the emergency exists. Now, sometimes that's good. We like what he's done, but that doesn't make the function of what he's done a good thing. You know, it's still problematic that he's acting in a legislative capacity. This is understandable for a few weeks. That's what the statute envisions. But two years, that's a totally different ballgame. You know, if the governor has introduced something that we say, wow, that really worked. What a great idea. Then the legislature can and should just act to make that part of the law. You know, yes, let's make that permanent. I mean, we could go on and on, probably this is for a different, a different program, about the changes that, you know, would be good to make permanent that came from the emergency orders. But that still doesn't get away from the fact that the legislature shouldn't be shirking its responsibility by leaving these kinds of things to the governor. Sure. Well, well Malia, you never have to apologize to me for being philosophical. <laughs> I, <laughs> there, there are times when we do have to be popular and take the popular will of the people into consideration. And, and so we do look to see whether the people want the lockdowns or not. At times, we have to be pragmatic and see whether there are good things that are coming out of the lockdowns in and of themselves. But you raise a very important question for democracy, and that is, are we constitutional? Uh, we have something, as you pointed out, called the balance of powers. And so the fact that we have one individual capable of declaring and maintaining almost perpetually a state of emergency seems to work against that balance of powers. And it mitigates not only the role that the or the powers that the legislature has, and those powers ostensibly represent the people, but it also mitigates the responsibility that the legislature takes or needs to take for, for what goes on. And so I think more people do need to talk about what you're raising, and that is the damage that is done to the balance of powers, which is an essential constitutional part of the way we do government in the United States. Now, um, back in the 2021 legislative session, there were already attempts to curb the emergency powers. In fact, there was a bill, we were very disappointed that it ultimately did not pass. Do you want to tell us a little bit about that? Yes, that was a HB 103, which basically was trying to create a mechanism where the governor would need legislative approval to extend the emergency past the 60 day time limit in the, in the statute. As it is right now, the statute just says an emergency terminates at 60 days. And then it doesn't specify what happens after that. So the governor has, in, during the COVID emergency, just extended and extended and extended. And there's nothing that says he can do that, but there's nothing that says he cannot. And so far, he, it has been allowed to continue. Uh, HB 103 wanted to put a stop to that, and it did move through the legislature and was supported by a lot of different public interest groups, obviously the Grassroots Institute, also groups like Common Cause, and you know even the Hawaii Government Employees Association uh, were behind it. But the bill failed in conference committee for somewhat mysterious reasons. Uh, we've looked into it and we've heard that maybe it failed because of disagreement over you know, how it was exactly that the governor had to get the legislature's approvals approval for the extension of the emergency. Um, we know that the governor didn't really want to um, 
that bill to pass. So there, there is that. That is a consideration as well in the way it failed. Right. Well, I suppose it's a case of when we get behind closed doors, we don't know really what goes on in those conference committees. But uh, whatever reasoning took place that led to the demise of HB 103, let's look ahead this legislative session. Uh, are there any bills on the docket that would address the problem of indefinite emergencies? and some of the other issues related to it, such as emergency management, well, within the emergency management statute? Well, there are a few bills that speak specifically to our concerns. Um, most significant at the moment is HB 1585, because it's being heard tomorrow, in Tuesday, in the House Committee on Pandemic and Disaster Preparedness. This bill lets the legislature end an emergency, either in part or in whole, which is an interesting twist, um, by a two-thirds vote. It also clarifies that emergency powers have to be consistent with the Constitution, and it creates parameters for the suspension of law including the requirement that there be a justification when a law is suspended, which is uh, pretty important uh, for those who feel like some of the laws have just sort of been suspended for convenience sake. Uh, you know, well, I understand that you're working with the team on some testimony for that bill in particular. And uh, uh, one of the questions that, that uh, arises is uh, what value is there in, in, in the legislature being able to overrule even just a portion of the decree of the governor? That's actually a very interesting uh, thing. And yes, we we're going to submit testimony on this bill, um, which we think for the large part is a really good bill. It takes some important steps um, to curb this indefinite emergency thing and put a legislative check on the governor's powers. The reason that you might want the legislature to end an emergency in part is because there are because phasing out some things it, when you end the emergency, you can everything that was in the proclamation in theory would just end, you know, including some of these things that we might like, or that might require, if say example, you wanted to, the legislature wanted to end the emergency on the whole, but there were elements of, you know, the safe travel system or, you know, vaccine elements, requirements and such that they wanted to preserve. This would let them preserve portions of that emergency until they could, address that because all of a sudden let's just say one day you have the safe travels in place and then the next day you don't it creates a bit of uncertainty and problems so you can see why having it end in part is useful the other reason is that um, there's the possibility that certain funds are tied especially federal funds would be tied to the fact that you are in a state of emergency and so you wouldn't want to completely uh, and the emergency in order to take advantage of that. So there are reasons why you wouldn't necessarily, um, why we wouldn't necessarily have an issue with partially ending the emergency and partially keeping it in place. That's not automatically a problem. Uh, for the most part, this is a good bill. I'd like to see uh, some stronger language in the way that the governor would need to get approval from the legislature to extend an emergency, because as it's written, it does let the, it, it does let the governor extend an existing emergency. Um, and I'd like to see a few more protections in place for transparency and for the uh, civil rights, especially uh, property rights. But it's a really good step in the right direction. Well, that's good to hear. And you're talking about HB 1585. Yes. Uh, I agree with you. I, I think that the fact that it's not an all or nothing kind of bill, the fact that it's not throw the baby out with the bathwater bill, but is a little more surgical than that, makes it feasible. It makes it more practical and realistic in terms of trying to manage what's going on in, in the public. And, and more than that, it, it may allow us to retain some of the emergency features that have actually been good that perhaps in the long run, such as telemedicine, such as reciprocal licensing uh, for medical personnel from other states, uh, Things, these things, which in the long run may be good for Hawaii, we can retain them a bit. Um, we're going to take a break now, but when we come back, I, I'd like to hear a little bit more about what's going on at the legislature in terms of other bills and uh, how effective you think they may be. Uh, I'm with Malia Hill now, 
policy director of the Grassroot Institute. And we're going to take a short break and then she'll be right back talking about what the legislature is doing in terms of altering the perpetual states of emergency that one official, the governor, is able to enact. I'm Kili'i Akina on the Think Tech Hawaii Broadcast Network. Don't go away. We'll be right back. Aloha, I'm Joshua Cooper, and welcome to Cooper Union. We look at what's happening with human rights around the world, and we invite you to tune in every Tuesday where we feature the voices of the people from the front lines sharing the struggles for self-determination, for the importance of sustainability and solidarity with one another to make the world a better place for all of humanity. If you can't catch it live, you can also Look at thinktechhawaii.com, as well as on Vimeo and many other places to catch the amazing shows where we hear from authors, activists, academics, analysts, and artists who are contributing to positive social change around the planet. Aloha Mekapono. Thank you for joining us for Justice. Aloha, everyone. Welcome back. Thanks for sticking around. You're watching Hawaii Together on the Think Tech Hawaii Broadcast Network. I'm Kili'i Aquino with Malia Hill, the Policy Director of the Grassroot Institute. Malia, you were telling us about an important bill that would potentially curb the emergency powers of the governor, giving the legislature more power and responsibility, thus restoring to some extent the uh, balance of powers, an important feature in our constitutional form of government. There's some other bills that are worth noting as well. Do you want to comment on some of them? Yes, 1585 is the only one that's had a heat is up for a hearing so far, but there are a few other bills that have been introduced um, that haven't yet been heard. Uh, there's HB 1416, which is essentially a replica of last year's bill. Um, it's very similar to the one that's being heard already in that it allows for a termination of an emergency by a legislative resolution. And it has similar provisions about the suspension of laws and um, the emergency powers having to be exercised in accordance with the constitution. Um, there's a Senate bill, SB 3285, that's the Senate version version of the one that's being heard in the House. Um, and then there's a pair of bills, HB 2121 and SB 3089, that are part of the governor's package. So the governor has sort of weighed in um, on Well, that's, uh, that's quite interesting. Uh, and um, let's take a look at that a bit, because I, I find some of the approach of the governor quite in, quite uh, telling in terms of his posture toward what the legislature is trying to do in terms of reducing the powers of the governor. Yes, it, it is interesting. Um, it does have uh, some some similar similarities to the other bills in that it does have language about constitutionality, the state constitution having to, you know, all emergency powers have to be in accordance with the state constitution. It has some similar language about suspension of laws um, having to be justified and having, you know, to end as soon as they can. Um, but the way that it deals with that real big question, the 60 day termination clause, is that it codifies that the governor can extend emergencies through supplemental proclamations, which is effectively what he has been doing this whole time. It just puts it into law that what he has been doing this whole time is completely okay and legal, which raises some interesting questions. Um, it's almost like an acknowledgement that, hey, maybe this wasn't 100% okay and legal up till now, but you know, now for sure, you can 100% do that. Very interesting. Uh, yeah, and it does not, I think it probably goes without saying, but it does, the governor's version, the governor's package bill does not have a provision that would let the legislature end an emergency by any kind of vote. We'll take a look at the battle over that. Now, <laughs> yes. Also 1496, which deals with gatherings in public. Yes, there, there is a bill, you know, there's, there are so many bills introduced and, you know, it's a, a lot of them touch on emergencies in different ways. Um, there is one 1496 that 
basically allows the restrictions on public congregations in a state of emergency. This has been a real tripping uh, point of debate for people, um, especially regarding restaurants and bars and retail food establishments. That's specifically what this bill is about, allowing them to limit service to vaccinated persons or patrons with a negative test for a contagious disease, very specific bill. But this bill also says it can, the restriction can last no more than 30 days and that it requires legislative approval in either regular or special se session if you're going to extend it. So it's a real mixed bag <laughs> as bills go and it's interesting to see it um, as one of the ones that was introduced this year. Well, take a look at all these bills together. Would any of them really have an impact in terms of stopping the governor from extending, continuing to extend, that is, his emergency orders in, in the fashion we've seen over the last two years? You know, it's interesting to put it that way because while we, we've been sort of talking about these bills and the emergency powers and the emergency management statute in terms of stopping the governor, what we really, really want is a return to balance of powers. That's the real goal here. So it's not so much, you know, getting these mechanisms to stop the governor as just ending the ambiguity of this 60 day time limit and finding a way to make sure that people have a voice in the way that this emergency is an emergency is managed uh, via their elected representatives. Uh, so that's important to remember because there are several of these bills that do allow the legislature to end an emergency via resolution or a vote, et cetera. So hypothetically, that makes it possible to stop these indefinite emergencies, exactly like what we we're talking about. But it's really, really important to recognize that it's a vote. So it isn't the that it would stop the governor, it's that it would make it possible for the legislature to stop the governor, assuming that the legislature does vote to stop the governor. So, you know, it's it's a subtle difference, but it's important because just because you pass this bill, let's say, if you are really, really want it into the emergency, the bill passes, it doesn't mean that that will end the emergency. The, the legislature could choose not to act, the legislature could choose to endorse the continued uh, emergency proclamations. I think what you've said underscores the importance of citizens getting involved in the voting process. Uh, we have every legislator in the House of Representatives as well as the Senate up for election this coming election, 2022. And uh, if we really want to see a legislature that is empowered to stand against uh, the executive branch when necessary in order to balance the powers. Uh, it, we also need to see that we've got the right people in there to vote the way that uh, they should vote. And so this is my plug. It's my, my commercial plug. Thing. <laughs> exactly. Though. There's no substitute for civic engagement. We talk about the legislature kind of giving up responsibility and handing it over to the governor, well, the people can, cannot do the same thing when it comes to the legislature, just because the legislature is there, it doesn't give you an excuse to just check out and not act and not be engaged because the legislature will only act if people are engaged. Right. Now, at the same time, with all of this concern over the balance of powers, we recognize that there is a role for the executive. Uh, we do have natural disasters from time to time. There are other kinds of emergencies, catastrophic in nature, that occur. And we do definitely want to have someone in a position of power capable of acting on behalf of all the people. Now, do these restrictions on governor's emergency powers represented in some of the legislation going forward prevent the governor from being able to act when he needs to, to respond to natural disasters or catastrophic emergencies? And short answer is no. This is actually one of the things that does make it difficult to amend the law is that in all fairness to the legislature, they are trying to walk a line where they preserve the ability to respond to emergencies, but take advantage of what we've learned through the pandemic uh, to prevent the indefinite exercise of executive power without a legislative check. So these are changes are very specific. Um, so 
really specifically tailored to address the shortcomings in the existing law. It's very obvious that when this law was written, it just was never intended to cover an extended health emergency. It's really designed to deal with these more immediate natural disasters, catastrophic emergencies that you're talking about, and that won't go away. You know, it's important to recognize we're really not at a place where we're able to construct the legal system that surrounds emergencies from scratch. We're doing this on the fly as, as a society. What we're trying to do is correct uh, a flawed Emergency Powers Act while, we, while it, we're actually using it at the, at the same time. So that's quite an, an interesting dynamic as we advocate for constitutional structures, but at the same time, recognize the pragmatic issues that need to be addressed. Now, um, I, I've got a question that I, I've been thinking about for a while, many people have. Um, at the Grassroot Institute, we're, we're very committed to transparent government, open and accountable government. And so we were concerned when originally the governor uh, enacted the, the first emergency decree and actually suspended some public records law at that time. Now. Is there anything being done to fully restore public records laws and government transparency in general for the public? Well, you know, that's a very good question. You know, uh, Hawaii was the only state to suspend public records law early in the pandemic, and it was lifted um, a few months later. But there was a lot of criticism. Grassroot Institute joined that criticism um, from government watchdog groups, Common Cause, uh, Civil Beat, of the governor for taking that action. It seemed unnecessary. Uh, this was definitely something that you would like to see a rationale for the suspension of the law. Um, there has been a bill introduced specifically on that issue, SB 20. 2916, it prevents suspension of open records or vital statistics requests during an emergency. Obviously, that's a very good law, and I would like to see it pass, but you know, there's no reason why we couldn't see protections for transparency added to whichever emergency management bill moves forward this session. It would be nice to see that element in there. It would be nice to see something that recognizes the need for greater transparency uh, from those executive from the in the part of the executive and his advisors and the actions taken in an extended emergency like Very that good. now malia my last question for you has to do with your role one of the things you do as policy director for the grassroot institute is scour the country for best practices uh, to find where there are states that may have solved problems that we have um, ha have you seen any of the kind of legislation we're talking about getting in, into effect in hawaii go forward in other states well, you know, it's it's interesting. You talk about, you know, trying to adapt and respond to the problem on the fly, and that is happening in almost every state. Uh, according to the National Conference of State Legislators, legislators in every single state proposed some kind of measure to address executive emergency powers during the pandemic during the pandemic once it started. Uh, it had different, it fared differently. Different states have different laws. Um, some are, are already more constrained than the, the one in Hawaii. Some states have laws that separate different kinds of emergencies and who's allowed to act and why and so on. So a lot of them have different time limits. Um, but bills were enacted in about nine, at least 19 states. 19 different states made changes to their emergency management law based on the experience during the COVID-19 pandemic. About half of them limited the length of time that a governor could maintain a state of emergency, or they required legislative approval to extend a state of emergency. So Hawaii is not even close to alone here. <laughs> Well, Malia, I want to thank you very much for being with us today. Our guest, Malia Hill, Policy Director for the Grassroot Institute of Hawaii. I'm Kili'i Akina, President of Grassroot Institute, and you're watching Hawaii Together on the Think Tech Hawaii Network. Thanks, everyone, for being with us. Thanks again, Malia. Thank you.